morning. Uh, it is February 13th. I know uh, what the American church is used to is themed messages. So if it's Christmas, you have to hear about how Jesus was born. And uh, if it's Easter, it's a resurrection message. And because it's Valentine's Day, it should be some kind of Valentine's message. The problem is, is, is God's not an American. Uh, he's not following our calendar. Uh, and I have never felt particularly led of the Spirit to preach uh, three points in a poem that have to do with this week's events. Uh, so as I heard a brother in this church sharing some uh, word Wednesday night, I was moved in my spirit. I began to study, and I believe God's given us a good word. And it has absolutely nothing to do with Valentine's Day. Is that okay with you? Yeah, it always came off as cheesy to me anyway. This is not sage on a stage. Should not be some fat guy in a suit telling you how to live your lives. This is a community of believers where we each have a certain function. And I believe that God has given me some instruction that will help you the same way that it's already helping me. And by the way, if you want to know what sermon book I go get all this stuff from, it, it's the book of my own weakness. It's whatever I'm struggling with. So don't ever get the idea I'm saying I'm better than you. In fact, whatever I've preached on in the last 17 years has been whatever I was struggling with that week usually. Okay? So are we all on the same page then? Amen. 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 Uh, by the way, I don't own any of those sermon books. And I wouldn't want them if, if somebody gave them to me. So hang on to them. Uh, I don't think you get anywhere with God preaching about other people's experience. I think you need to talk about the way that your testimony works. Right? We can all argue about what a scripture means. You cannot argue about what it means to me. Uh, amen? amen? Okay, so let's, let's pick up then. We're going to be in Genesis 27. Our message today is called Bethel to Peniel. 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 Yeah, I'm going to get it right. Bethel to Peniel. Uh, in Hebrew, Bethel, Bet or Beth, means house of. And uh, El is a name of God. So Bethel is the house of God. Peniel is uh, two Hebrew words. And one is faith. Face, that's the beginning of the word. Uh, and El, again, is God. So it's face of God. We are moving in this message from the house of God to the face of God. Uh, they may sound like a similar thing. You may have heard me preach on other subjects about the face of God, like Paneum, the bread that comes from His face, as Psalm 34 mentions, and showbread in King James Bible, those kind of things. But what we're going to talk about today is a man's journey. His name is Jacob, and uh, many of you should be familiar with him. If you're not, it's okay. You're going to learn a lot about him today. And he had some dramatic experiences in his life where there are certain monuments, markers, and one was at the house of God, Bethel, and the other was the face of God, Peniel. So are y'all in uh, Genesis 27? Yeah. Pick up with me in verse 42. <coughs> Something's happened with Jacob prior to this. Jacob's mama has encouraged him to trick his brother out of a blessing that was rightfully his brother's, but God knew would eventually fall to Jacob. That's crazy in and of itself. God says, ahead of time, these two boys represent two nations in your womb. The older will serve the younger. Exact opposite of the way God usually does things. He prophesied it before they were born. Uh, he prophesied it before they'd done anything good or bad. This was not God disliking, as some people have taught and misunderstand the scripture Esau. It was God saying, there is one of these boys that will represent a nation and my favor will be on that nation. The other nation my favor will not be upon, at least in the short term. In the end, Esau gets a blessing too, uh, his descendants too. But having said that, the trick has occurred. How do you feel when you're tricked? Anybody bought a car? <laughs> now forgive me those of you in the car business, I had to do that for years. Okay? Uh, if you've ever bitten into a hamburger and found out that the center of it was slightly raw, and you've already driven off, right? Uh, this is that kind of feeling. And Esau's a real human being. He, he's got this going on inside him. And I want to talk to you about Esau's feelings about what Jacob has done, and then we'll move on to Jacob. Uh, verse 42. When Rebekah was told that her older son Esau had, had said, uh, what? Let's see. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, Your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Boy, isn't that nice? Yeah, that's not Philadelphia there. It's not the city of brotherly love. Well, what we've got happening here is one brother 
is only able to wake up and carry on through the day with the thought of one day my dad won't be around and I get to kill my brother. That is a pretty horrible thing, huh? Yeah. But why did he feel that way? Well, his inheritance had been stolen. His spiritual blessing had been stolen. He said, well, he, wanted, he gave it up. He didn't value it. Those of you that are familiar with that story, it's all true. Doesn't mean he didn't feel defrauded. Are there not huge segments of every society that feel defrauded, whether anything was done bad to them or not? Of course. People have victims' mentalities. This is, this is the sinful nature. We, we're looking for a reason that we were wronged. And it really wasn't our fault, right? Well, how hard do you think it was for Esau to feel defrauded? Probably not very hard. And he wants to kill his brother. He wants justice. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to, to my brother Laban. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you, what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Was it that Mama didn't love Esau? No, she loved Esau, but she realized these two kids are going to kill each other. Right? It's true she loved Jacob best. But she realized she, her whole progenitory might be wiped out in a single day if these guys fight. <laughs> then Rebecca said to Isaac, I am disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. <laughs> yeah, so your mama's not the only one that can be dramatic or lay a guilt trip on you. <laughs> Esau's consoling himself with the thought of killing Jacob. Mom thinks Jacob should run, right? That's good mom advice, you know? <laughs> run. Mom cannot stand Hittite women. There's no clue or indication as to why she feels that way. Doesn't it feel random to you? You know? Uh, by the way, Patricia, Matthew and Mark are about to fight, and you say, hey, Matthew, why don't you run? And I hate these Hittite women. <laughs> that makes no sense. The word is interpreted in light of the word. And as you read these stories, if you look, all of the answers are there. Let's move down to 28 verse 1. So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him and commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of your mother's father Bethuel. Take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. Wow, think about what's happening. Dad says, don't marry one of these Canaanite women. I want you to go to Padan around and there I want you to get a wife. And then he reinforces a blessing. So it's not just once that Jacob gets a blessing that should have probably fallen to Esau. It's twice. Now. So if you're Esau, right? Presumably you're not here, you'd be choking your brother. But at some point, don't things that happen in your family eventually get back to you, right? Nobody keeps secrets forever. I mean, these days, it's uh, only as long as it takes somebody to type it on Facebook, right? <laughs> Watch this. Verse 6. Now Esau learned that Isaac had blessed Jacob and had sent him to Padan Aram to take a wife from there. All this talk about a wife. I thought the problem was Jacob and Esau. And that when he blessed him, he commanded him. Do not marry a Canaanite woman. At some point now, this is getting difficult for Esau. Are you kidding me? He commanded my brother to leave, number one. Number two, he blessed him again. And when he commanded him to leave, he said, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. If you're puzzled by that, watch what else happens. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Padan Aram. He learned that his brother was obedient. Boy, this is beginning to sound a little bit to me like Cain and Abel, right? We'll talk more about that in a minute. Look at verse 8. Esau then realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father Isaac. Displeasing the Canaanite women were. Still a very general statement, huh? Mm -hmm. So he goes and he marries Mahalah, a sister of Naboth, and the daughter of Ishmael, son of Abraham, in addition to the wives he already had. Is there a little hint there? Mom can't stand Canaanite women. Dad can't stand Canaanite women. 
I hate my brother who's getting blessed and he's getting sent off. And they both told him, do not marry a Canaanite woman. So he goes and marries a Semitic woman. In addition to who? The wives he already had. Look, look at Genesis 26, 34. And keep your finger in Genesis 28. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Berei, the Hittite. Hittite is a Canaanite tribe. And also Basemeth, daughter of Elon, the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. You thought you had mother-in-law problems, right? His mama and daddy disliked his wives so much that his mama says, I am disgusted with life because of these women. And if my other son marries one of them, it won't be worth living. How are you feeling if you're Esau? Brother's got your blessing. Brother married the acceptable one, or is going to. Yours are all looked down upon. Could you be filled with feelings of injustice? Yeah. How much danger do you think Jacob is in at this point? Esau wanted to kill him. He's fueled by feelings of injustice, jealousy, personal inadequacy. Right? Why am I never good enough? This has all the makings of a Cain and Abel story, doesn't it? Why did Cain hate Abel? <coughs> because Abel's offerings were accepted. His were jealousy, fraud, inadequacy. Mm -hmm. See, the story is playing out all of the time. The obedient are the ones that are blessed. And you said, but wait, Jacob's not even really obedient. Oh, he was and didn't even know it. He did all the right things for all the wrong reasons. He's walking in God's plan for his life and he doesn't even know it. And he's doing it in ways that are not necessarily God. But his brothers made no attempt. Didn't value the spiritual things as much as a bowl of lentils. Friends, that's beans. He didn't care as much about the blessing of God as he did a bowl of beans. Apparently his mom and dad had counseled him about Canaanite women. Because his brother was obedient in going to get a wife that was not Canaanite. That kind of implies that Esau had not been obedient. Now, if you, knowing what you know about Esau and Jacob, had to picture these two in a UFC match, yeah. <laughs> who do you think is going to win? Esau. Probably Esau, right? So was mom's advice good advice? Yeah. I'm just curious. I don't know how you came to Jesus, but I came to Jesus realizing that death was at my doorstep. Amen. Realizing that I was sowing so much bad seed that it had all come home to roost and there was no meaningful hope for my life if there was not dramatic change. I began to understand that I was a monstrous sinner before God. And that if He didn't help me, there was no hope for me. My salvation prayer was not uh, what's printed in people's tracks and usually led at altars by people wanting to put USDA stamps on Christians. Mm. My, my salvation prayer was, Lord, change me. Mm. Everything about me is thoroughly wrong. Mm. I've learned through the years that when people get born again in Mass at an altar, it may or may not be God. You have to just kind of watch. When people get born again and they're alone in their room, when somebody else didn't facilitate it, it came from God, you should keep an eye on that one. Now, I'm, not, I'm not trampling on your experience here today. I'm telling you that powerful things happen when you're left alone to deal with God. Jacob is leaving something. He's leaving his trouble. He's looking for a new direction in life. Turn with me to Genesis 28, 10. Tell me when you're there. Yeah. I was going to say, that wasn't a, that wasn't a big transformation. <laughs> <beat it. laughs> now, I want to tell you, it's okay to talk to me here in church. We're, we're, uh, we're not intimidated by speech from the audience. This was never supposed to be uh, an audience. We're a community of believers. Uh, we're in Genesis 28, 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. What a crazy thing to say, right? You know, he didn't say he left Bunky, Louisiana and set out for Houston, Texas. He said he left Beersheba. And tell us that means nothing, because we don't live in Israel, right? You're like, is that where the first Budweiser factory was? Beersheba. You know? Well, y'all never heard that there was a Budweiser factory. I understand. I wasn't raised in church. Beersheba to, Har to Haran. Beersheba was a place that Abraham, the grandfather of, I, of Jacob, had an experience with God. 
It was a well was in Beersheba. It wasn't called Beersheba yet. And he began contending with Ahimelech over this well. And once there was a treaty that was uh, struck actually over seven wells, Abram planted an evergreen tree there to mark it forever. This is the place where God gave me living water for me and my descendants. Mm -hmm. There's a message there if you think about that. That's all about Jesus. Mm -hmm. He is the evergreen tree, yeah. the never dying tree that marks the wells of salvation. Mm -hmm. But it didn't just happen to Abram. It also happened to Isaac, Jacob's father. He was fighting with a guy named Phicol. And over the very same thing. Uh, it's a generation later, people were stopping up his wells, and uh, shepherds in the field of Gerar, actually, stopped up the wells, and there's a fight that ensues over it. And when God comes to his rescue at Beersheba, he builds an altar there. So if you're the third generation, if you're Jacob, you're leaving a place where all your fathers experienced God. You're leaving the place of their testimony. You're leaving the southernmost boundary of Israel. And where are you headed? to a place called Haran. Haran is so far from Beersheba by Old Testament standards. It's 500 miles, roughly. That's five times the distance from, say, Jerusalem to Galilee, right? I mean, traveling from the Galilee where Mary and Joseph uh, found out they were pregnant all the way to Jerusalem was a major epic journey. Jews had to do that about three times a year. But to travel from Beersheba all the way to Haran was five times that distance. How do you carry enough jerk? How do you carry enough stuff to go that far? I mean, it's just him. How do you handle something like that? This is a journey of epic proportions. Mike, Mike preached about epic, and it has heroes in it. It has uh, villains in it. it has uh, heroic themes in it. He sets out for this place. By the way, if you were going to do this today, you would have to cross three modern-day countries. Three. Uh, Jesus never, as an adult, left Israel. He never walked further than about 120 miles, ever. That's an amazing thing, huh? But this guy's got to go 500 miles. Is it fair to say that this is a big journey? Yeah. Well, he doesn't make it a third of the way. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place. Come on now, have you ever been headed a direction but God met you along the way in a place called a certain place that you hadn't expected? I was in worship today and because I felt like the Lord spoke to me some word for somebody in here, and I felt like it was probably a couple. Uh, I even thought of certain states, but I won't get into all of that. Because that happened, uh, then I was just enjoying the Lord's presence. And kind of like uh, you reach the top of the hill, then I, I thought we would just kind of, kind of taper down. And somewhere in the middle of one of those songs, I was surprised. I was in that certain place again. Mm. I felt the Lord's presence all around me. I felt a little bit like my whole body was tingling. Right? Uh, if that makes you uncomfortable, I'm sorry. It, it usually makes people uncomfortable to hear somebody talk about their love in such a, a passionate way. Right? Well, I feel like that. Uh, about my wife, of course. I feel that way about my children. But Jesus surpasses all of that mm -hmm. by far. Mm -hmm. He comes to a place that the Bible calls a certain place. Now, we know from this story that later it's called Bethel, house of God. Uh, it's kind of crazy. If you look at a satellite photo of Bethel, you can go to Israel and they'll show you these. They, they sell them <laughs> in tourist shops. The mountain ranges there, just the mountain ranges, taking a view from above, have Hebrew letters written into them. I don't mean like Mount Rushmore where somebody's carved it. I mean the topography itself forms shadows where there are valleys, and the valleys say Yahweh is my name. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, the, Israel is the only land in the world that God has literally stamped His name in. Okay? It can be discerned on that map, but my Hebrew is pretty rough, and so uh, it's better to Google it. <laughs> okay. A certain place. You are not here by accident. Amen. I just want to tell you that. Amen. Acts 17, 26 says, God determines the times and places men would live and work. He does this so that we will reach out to Him and find Him, though He's not far from us. Amen. This is not an accident. Well, it's not an accident that Jacob is in a certain place. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. This is as good a reason as any. 
Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth. You thought Led Zeppelin made this stuff up, huh? <laughs> With its tops reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Jacob lays down, he puts his head on a rock. That's not Motel 6, friends. You know? My wife and I argue and fight over our pillows almost every evening. It's become a game. Now I, I wait till she gets up to go brush her teeth. I don't know what your wives are like, but mine has this entire ritual that revolves around you know, flossing and washing. And, they, and it takes an extraordinary length of time. And it, it's enough time that I, I get to uh, steal a couple of her pillows, put them on my side, and then take mine and put them on hers. It's, it's become a game. And then I wait to see how long it takes her to realize it. And then we kind of fight and wrestle over them, right? <laughs> Jacob's got nobody there to fight and wrestle with. He's alone. He's alone and he's got no place to lay his head. Powerful things happen when you're deprived of comfort, when you're deprived of consenting opinions around you. It gives you a chance to be put in a place you can actually hear from God. And he sees the heavens and he sees angels ascending and descending on a stairway or a ladder. In other words, this is before we've ever seen Captain Kirk say, beam me up, Scott. It's before we've ever seen science fiction. He is seeing people go into the heavens, people, I should say angels, <coughs> into the heavens and go from the heavens to the earth. He sees it like an escalator, if you will, except they have no words for those things. Uh, another way you might to say it is a kind of porthole. Now, I'm not trying to say something weird. I'm just trying to say, he recognized this is different than everywhere else I've ever been. He becomes aware of something. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. He just left the places where those relationships were defined. He's headed on a journey to find his own relationship with God. <clears throat> and God meets with him at a certain place where the heavens open to him and angels are ascending and descending. He said, I'm the same God that met with them. I love about our King. He meets you where you are. He doesn't say to you, you must go to such and such place unless you already have a relationship with Him. When you already have a relationship with Him, you have to be obedient to Him. When you don't yet have a relationship with Him, He's drawing you by His Spirit and He's looking for you wherever you are. Wow, that's an amazing thing. Where were you when He found you? Were you further along than now? Probably not. Huh? This ought to give you encouragement during your most difficult day today. You were worse off when He found you. So what does that say about His love for you right now? It must be pretty profound. Do you love something more or less after you've invested years into it? Yeah. They become cherished. They become heirlooms. Jesus said, My Father delights in giving you the kingdom. Jacob's having his experience with God, independent of his family. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. Come on now. If we, uh, if we picked up anybody in the room, if we picked Bill uh, and said, Hey, Bill and, and, and Terry, here's the thing. I'm going to give you Houston. But your, your, your descendants will spread out to the east. And they'll spread out to the west. And the north and the south. Well, let's just take east. They would move from here to, say, Louisiana. They would skip that state. And they would go to the other. <laughs> There's a Texan in here. I'm teasing. I'm from Louisiana. So they would move to the east. And they would move to the west and the north and the south. Where does that stop? It never does. This is why Paul says in Romans 4 that to Abraham and his descendants, it was revealed that they would be the heir of the world. This blessing would never stop. It is the rock cut out of a mountain in Daniel that filled the whole earth. It is the yeast that Jesus spoke of working through the whole loaf. It is expanding by its very nature. That's an important thing. If your faith is not growing, it's dead. If you're not learning and changing your mind and growing, if you've defined in stone the 14 points that are what you believe, all you believe, all you should ever consider and all anyone else should ever believe, you've put God in a coffin and He will not live there. In doing that, we put ourselves in a coffin too. 
When we draw a box around the things that we say we believe about God and say, you, your job, Pastor, is telling me the same thing I already know, but in a new and exciting way every week. You have paid hirelings and entertainers. All real interaction with God comes when you begin to venture outside your comfort zone of Beersheba. You go on a journey with you and God. You find yourself alone, stripped of comfort, stripped of consenting opinions who are saying, oh, yeah, you're great, you're wonderful, you're a champion. And you find yourself left there to contend with God. And in that situation, you can be confronted with truth that you never would have seen in other times. And then what you do with that truth, it determines the outcome of your life. The kingdom is founded upon the fact that a man can hear from God in heaven, receive a revelation, and build his life on it. This is what Peter was given as keys. The fact that he could receive from God knowledge that the one standing in front of him concealed in commonness was actually the Messiah. And he said so while it was hidden from other men. This never happens if he stays home with his fishing nets. It never happens if mom and dad are right there comforting him, telling him what he must believe about everything. Mom, dad, we were talking earlier about children and your ability to train them. Train them is not always to tell them what they must believe. It's to share with them how you believe, how you've interacted with God, how He's shown Himself, and then they have their own experience. And it defines their life. I had an experience. I was left alone with God. In 1993, my father was sent to a different state. My mother was busy doing something else. I had no relatives with me. I felt, even in a crowd, like I was a little alone at that point in my life. And God spoke to me for the first time. I heard His voice. Well, how did you hear His voice? Well, I leave that between you and God. I know what happened. His voice pressed me to the ground. I was a little Baptist kid. And I had no idea that God could do that. I was told, in fact, that He didn't do it anymore. That worked just fine for me until it happened. (laughs) The outcome of that event has steered the whole direction of my life. It was Jesus that chose my wife for me. It was Jesus that told me when we should have children and what to name them. It was Jesus that chose the location I would live in. It was Jesus that gave us the name of this church and told us to found it. All of those things. All based because I was left alone with Him. And He confronted me with some gut-wrenching truth. One of the first things he confronted me with is not everyone who says Lord, Lord will enter my kingdom. Mm -hmm. If you say you have fellowship with the Father and walk in darkness, you're a liar. See, I said I was a Christian. I won Bible awards in the private school I was attending because I'd been thrown out of the public school. Mm -hmm. But I had never really met Jesus. I knew about him like I knew about Bo Jackson, a famous football player. I knew his stats. Right? 240 pounds, ran the 40 in the 4 2. <laughs> I knew those things. I didn't know him. That night, he spoke to me. It changed my life. Jacob is having an experience like that. Early on, our experiences are defined by what we do in response to that revelation. Later on, our experiences are defined more by what God does to us because of revelation. And I'll show you that today. You all already bored? No. Should we stop here or sell the rest of the message for $19.99? <laughs> Silly, isn't it? Silly what, what gets the parlor tricks that are masqueraded as Christianity. Mm-hmm. These men in this world were real, just like us. Mm-hmm. They had real hurts, real desires, real fears, real concerns. I mean, why is Jacob going? Well, let's go on a journey with God. He also didn't want his brother to kick his tail. Right? You never had a moment where you were a little bit scared? <coughs> he did too. He did too. Uh, let's see. How about verse 14? Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you. Wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised for you. A revelation comes to Jacob. It doesn't have to do with the abundance of his possessions. He's just got a rock. (laughs) It doesn't have to do with the the grandness of his stature. He's a coward running from his brother. It doesn't have to do with the collection of his godly deeds. What is he best known for? Deceiving. God begins to meet with him and says, i got a plan for you, buddy, that is amazing. I could tell you about it, but you wouldn't believe it. I'm going to give you as much of this 
as you can possibly receive right now. It has to do with being confronted with a revelation and then deciding that action is required. Bethel is a place where we meet God for the first time. We come into His courts bringing something. Deuteronomy 16.16 16 says, No man should appear before the Lord empty-handed. So now he realizes he's in the presence of God. He knows that he should not be before the living God without offering something. But what does he have to offer? He offers him his life. His future. Is this not a little bit like you met God? I mean, if, I want to be honest. If you met the Lord, and what he said to you was, Oh, my son Dustin, I really need somebody like you. You're amazing. In fact, I'm thinking more of how I could be like you, Dustin. You didn't meet God. You didn't meet Him. If you came into this race starting somewhere other than being completely devoid of anything to offer God except your obedience, you started somewhere other than the starting line. Our revelation of God starts with realizing we have nothing to offer Him except our future. Too many musicians come into the kingdom and say they're going to use their talents for God. Too many talented speakers come into the kingdom and say they're going to use their talents for God. As if God saved them because of their great talent. Who gave them the talent in the first place? He couldn't give it to anybody he wanted. Who made man's mouth? God told Moses. It starts with realizing that everything that you've done has been bankrupt. Everything you've done is spiritually devoid of life. And saying whether I ever get to play a drum again, whether I ever get to sing a song or speak before people, before I ever decide another action in my life, you are going to be the source of everything. In fact, I will call you Lord only if you will save me. Yeah. Lord means owner and controller. Let me ask you, Christian, does He own you? Does He control you? Because Romans says, as many as are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Not as many who ascend to a creed. Not as many as who can go, uh-huh, at three key points during a, a prayer. As many as are led by His Spirit are the sons of God. It is the proof of His ownership that is like a seal upon you, guaranteeing you for the day of God's redemption. Does this mean that if I spoke in other tongues, I'm sealed to the day? No, it means if you are led by the powerful presence of God, you will always get where He wants you to go. It will end in redemption. It does not mean that because you got a, a brownie merit badge that you're good to go. This is not what the Gospel teaches. <laughs> Jacob's been confronted with revelation. <clears throat> when Jacob awoke from his sleep, wow, he awoke from his sleep in more ways than one, didn't he? He thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I... What's that say? Come on church, you can talk to me. Surely the Lord is in this place and I was unaware of it. Have you never been in the same place doing the same thing, but something was different today? That was the certain place God wanted to meet with you. I attended many church services. I was in lots of them before I had a day where I had a divine meeting with God. I'd been in my bedroom I don't know how many times, probably as many times as there were nights. But there was one day where it became my Bethel. I stood before the Lord and realized His presence was in the room and my entire life I've been sleeping and was unaware of it. Come on now. Did you have that kind of awakening? Yes. Yeah. Unaware of it. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Where is the gate of heaven? Where is the door of life? Where is the pathway to the eternal kingdom? It was where I saw angels ascending and descending. This rock is going to mark the spot. Do you remember a conversation, John, uh, in the book of John, in the first chapter? Jesus is having it with a man named Philip. He said, Philip, I saw you while you were sitting under a fig tree. Philip said, wow, you did? Yeah, you're a cool Israelite. There's no guy over here. He says, man, you're the Messiah. You believe me because I said I saw you under a fig tree? What if you see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man? Come on now, you guys are smart. What is Jesus telling him? I am 
Bethel. I'm the stairway. I'm the ladder. I'm the only way in which you can interact with heaven and heaven interacts with you. I'm the mediator between God and man. I have put my hand upon God's shoulder and upon man's and I have made peace between the two. Yeah. That's right. Wow. What a statement. So many people say, well, Jesus never said point blank on God. Yeah, He did. You just need to know His culture. Right. He said it as clear as day. It's no different than saying, I'm the one that sits in the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. What would that mean to you? We're talking to the president. He said, what if you see angels ascend and descend upon me? He said, I am the initiator of this experience with God. I am the facilitator of it. In fact, dealing with me is dealing with the Father. I'm His perfect representation. This is Bethel. It is where you meet Jesus. Well, what is His response then? Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head. He set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. Don't we all want to build monuments to our experiences with God? Right? I just got to tell you, I stood in a certain place in my room when He spoke to me for the first time. It forced me to the ground. While I was there, I had some neat things happen to me that have changed my life. I looked at a Bible, and I had always known it was the Word of God, but now in this moment, I understood how they wrote it. They felt this all around them. I had some pretty cool things happen. Anybody want to know? That happened on a Thursday night. Anybody want to know what happened Friday? I went back and got in that very same spot. And I prayed. Like, surely, you know. I mean, where were my feet again? What direction was I facing? What were those words I said? Nothing. It's like Samson's jawbone. It was useful that day, but it had to be thrown out. Our experience with God is that. It is an experience that we are seeking interaction and, and communication. And all the things in the past were for our was to encourage you, you can do it again tomorrow. It is manna that we go out and find every day. Not that we define in stone and build monuments to yesteryear with no experiences of our own today. Yeah, Is your book as big as John Wesley's? I mean, he founded the Methodist Church. Amazing man. How many Methodists are out there doing the same thing? Is your Bible as big as Martin Luther's? He changed the world in his day. How many Lutherans are doing that today? You see how we have a tendency to camp somewhere? I didn't even touch on the Pentecostals, who uh, some people would call me that, or the Charismatics. We have a tendency to build altars to try to touch God. And we, we mistake it as this is God, because this is the form where I last saw Him. It's little more than idolatry. What moved God in the first place? Obedience, His heart. The direction of his life, not the place. How about this? He called the place Bethel, though the city used to be called Loves. Then Jacob made a vow. If God will be with me, <laughs> you like that? If? <laughs> He's bargaining with God. When you meet Jesus, your nature is beginning to change. It's declared new, but in reality, the old is still passing away. I mean, it doesn't this strike you as a little odd? You've just met the God of the universe, and He says, well, God, if you'll do this for me, then I'll do this for you. If God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my Father's house. Is there anything else you want? You want safe passage? You want food? You want clothes? Then the Lord will be my God. Lord, if you do good things to me, I'll be, I'll be yours. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. Because God needs a house. I mean, He made the stone, but right? Yeah. <laughs> Makes you wonder how big the stone is, too. Yeah. How big is the stone that you think is God's house? Is it as big as your denomination? Big as your family? Big as your own experience? I want to tell you, God doesn't say, I'm looking for people that think outside the box. I mean, that's great. But even that's a reference to the box. He's looking for people to go, there's a box. <laughs> <laughs> and the stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tent. <laughs> I love it. But all new Christians are like this. Lord, if you really be as good to me as everybody's telling me that you are, then I will do something for you. 
I recently heard a testimony, a young man was uh, out of prison and in prison he'd gotten dramatically saved. And a great thing because he couldn't be corrupted by the American church at that point. He was in jail, right? And one thing about jail is you have a gut-wrenching reality of uh, uh, the sum total of your life at that moment. You don't usually need to be convinced you're a sinner. And uh, he got dramatically saved. Got to spend six days a week in the Word and so he learned to love jail, right? He gets out, he goes to a church here in North Houston and... Um, the youth pastor uh, who asked him to leave a youth service because he was 19. Maybe. We've got rules, you know. Uh, said, well, I, I know you accepted Jesus in your heart. The young man interrupted him in front of a church that has hundreds of people in it. He said, accepted Jesus in my heart. I don't know what y'all called it, but I died. I died that he might live in me. I didn't accept Jesus into my heart. Mm -hmm. That sounds so sweet. It's like getting a little Valentine candy or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He said, my life ended that day that I could live for him. Wow. Oddly enough, the young man's not fitting so well in that congregation. <laughs> Would you recognize Jesus if you saw him? Any of the prophets? I mean... Would you want a guy in your church that shaved his head with a sword? I just got to tell you, the ways of God are a little different than men. Like I taught you about Jesse's sons. The things that God apprises are despised among men. The things that men apprise are despised by God. There's one thing He wants from you. It's your obedience. And you meet Him at a place called Bethel. This is where our relationship begins. God initiates, and we realize that we need to respond. But as the relationship progresses, certain things happen. We're going to study that as we look at Peniel. And don't worry, don't look at your watches. We'll get you out of here right when Jesus wants you to. I want to tell you, though, you have a note section in your bulletin. Uh, why don't you write something for me? This will help you get what you need to get quickly. Because we're all about efficiency, right? I mean, that's what the American church is. Let's move them through like cattle. Let's get you in, get you happy, and get you out and see if we can extract a few dollars and a plate on the way. Right? Don't call me during the week. I play golf. Right? Don't meet with me or expect me to pastor you. What I am is I'm your paid speaker. Isn't that what we're used to? Don't accept it. That is not Christianity. Christianity is your pastor is your brother. He happens to speak occasionally from a pulpit, but pastoring is what goes on when you're not behind the pulpit. I don't work for you. I work for Jesus. And He's very concerned about your lives, not just the face you show on Sunday. Sunday can be so much like a prom date. You know? Everybody wears their best clothes. We show up and, you know, we all agree that it's going to be a wonderful evening and we pose for pictures. But that's not a marriage. You know, a marriage is sometimes you don't have your makeup on, ladies. A marriage is you know each other. The King of the universe does not want you to date Him. He wants your life. Amen. All right, y'all got your pens out? You ready to write? I'm going to give you seven things here. I, I despise when preachers give lists, but these are seven things you will find in the next scripture, period. Okay, so I didn't make the list. God did. Uh, number one is alone. When you've written it, say, got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Number two is wrestled. You can spell phonetically because you don't want me to do it for you. <laughs> Number three is Saul, like S A W. No, I lied. Number four, touched. Number five, <coughs> talked. Talked. Talked, like I can't speak the English language. T A L K E D. Talked. Yeah. <laughs> Number six, changed. Number seven is blessed. Now we're about to move on to Peniel. You'll see about Peniel in Genesis 32. But before you turn to Genesis 32, I want to tell you, all of these elements that I've just mentioned are going to be expressly stated in Genesis 32, but they are implied in Genesis 28. Let me ask you something. Was Jacob alone with God at Bethel? Did he wrestle with something at Bethel? Why is he saying, if... You will do this, God. He's wrestling with the revelation of God. Did he see something at Bethel? Yes. Surely God was in this place and I had not previously perceived it. 
I wasn't aware of it. I had not seen it. Did he try to touch God in some kind of way at Bethel? Yes, he built an altar. He poured anointing oil on it, representing God's presence. Right there. Right? This is his attempt to contact heaven. Did he talk with God at Bethel? Yes, God gave him a dream. He prayed to God. It was the beginning of his communication. Was he changed at Bethel? Yes. Well, it's the beginning of it. It determined the direction he was going. It determined the outcome of his life. Was he blessed at Bethel? Yes. Yes, this is the first time you have hope for the young man's character, isn't it? It's the first time you see the seed of something that might eventually bear fruit unto salvation. Are you relating to any of this? Yes. yes. Okay, Genesis 32. He started with Long. Long was alone. Oh, alone. Alone. No, not alone. I, if you need alone, see Matthew. <laughs> My character reference is Jesus. You in Genesis 32? Yes. You going to be patient with me a couple minutes? Yes. yes. Here comes Genesis 32, starting in verse 22. How much time has passed, by the way? About 14 years. Uh, I mean, this is a long time. Jacob now has wives, right? Mom and dad said, go get a wife. How many did he get? How did that happen? What happened to Jacob? Was he tricked? He was deceived. Isn't it amazing how you can find yourself in situations, even as you're walking with Jesus, where you're not reaping the penalty from God for things you've done in the past, but you're still living with seeds you've sown. Yeah. Right? I mean, if you had no social skills and you got born again, did you have social skills the next day? <coughs> no. God credits you with right standing, but you still don't know how to talk to a girl. Right? <laughs> Jacob goes through a process. This one day that we're going to read about in his life, it's like the culmination of the process. But everything Jacob had ever done to Esau was done to Jacob over the last 14 years. As he began to experience God and learn what it was like to walk with God. If God said strip some branches and throw them in a, a thing, he did it. He saw God move in response to his obedience. He did what God said to do. And now we're going to have an event before he meets Esau. Look at verse 22 of chapter 32. That night, Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons. <laughs> Has God blessed Jacob? <laughs> How about that? And crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. <coughs> so Jacob was left alone. alone. He was alone at Bethel. He's now alone at Peniel. These are the times in your life by the way, how far away is everybody? Just the other side of the street. But when you're left with nobody to deal with you on a subject, except God, this is a time when you get God's opinion rather than everyone else's. Now don't think you have to go climb a mountain to do this or isolate yourself. What you have to do is decide that God's opinion is the most important to you. I want to tell you there are many times I'm in a crowded room with lots of opinions and I'm not even listening to everyone anymore. What I'm doing while I'm sitting there smiling is praying and asking God internally, what do you think about this situation? I've learned to hear from God in a crowded room because I know what it is to be alone with Him. I know what His voice sounds like. I have daily interaction with Him. I know when it's Him and when it's me trying to pass myself off as Him. Don't act like you've never done it. God wants me to have the one with the V8. <laughs> Personal experience, amen. <laughs> so Jacob was left alone. A man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that the hip was wrenched. And as he wrestled with the man, the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? In Hebrew, name is Hashem. It means your, what do people call you, but it also means what is your authority? What is your reputation? What's your body of work? How do people know you? It's not just 
you know, what are the phonetic sounds that make your name up? This is why Hebrew names are a little bit like Indian names, right? Stands with a fist. Why? Because she stood with a fist. When God gives people names, it's based on their deeds. Okay? You are, even a child is known by his actions, the Bible says. In any case, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name, your function, your authority, your character, your reputation will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. Please let me understand the totality of who you are. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel saying, it is because I saw God <coughs> face to face and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. There are some action words here. One is a, is a descriptor. That's alone. But then there are six action words right after it. Wrestled, saw, touched, talked, changed, blessed. The one who is doing all of those things is no longer Jacob. It is no longer Jacob who is wrestling with the thoughts of God. If God... You uh, are good to me, then I'll be good to you. It's no longer Jacob who's trying to see God. It is no longer Jacob who is trying to touch God by building an altar. It is no longer Jacob who is trying to talk with God and communicate with Him. It is no longer Jacob who is trying to change who God is by saying, you'll be my God if you do certain things for me. It is no longer Jacob who is trying to bless God, saying, I'll give you a tenth of everything I've got. As his walk has progressed and as life has taught him through trials, now God has shown up to do something for and in Jacob. And it begins by isolating him from everyone so that he doesn't have the affirmation of his peers. It's like God said, as one brother told me the other night, let's dance, you and I. He shows up and he begins to wrestle. He begins to wrestle with Jacob. Now, let me ask you something. <coughs> As confident as any young man is in his physical prowess, is there any chance that any man could even overcome an angel if you believe this was an angel? No, one angel killed 185,000 men during Hezekiah's day. Isaiah wrote about it. Kings and Chronicles speak of it. There's no chance. So why is he wrestling with him? This was a way to struggle with the man. Through all of his ups and downs, struggling with him, having physical interaction with him. In Psalm 33, verse 3, David says the Lord is faithful in all of his ways. He's trustworthy in all he does. How do you say somebody's trustworthy if you've never been in a situation where you had to trust him? How do you say somebody's faithful in all of their ways unless there were some of their ways you were like, not sure? David's experience had taught him that. Our God is looking to be with you in a situation where you have to see His face to make it. And it is a wrestling match. It's, Lord, everything around me says my body's as good as dead, but since you have said I'm going to have a child, I believe you and I'm going to act like it. I'm going to buy baby clothes. Yeah. He is looking for that wrestling match. Now, what Orthodox Christianity says is the wrestling match doesn't exist. You simply believe and it's all done. I'm telling you God is looking for that back and forth tug of war because it shows the sincerity of your faith. Yeah. It shows that it's difficult for you. They're sacrificing it, but you were doing it. God could have overcome him at any moment. He wrestled with him because our God wants to know us through interaction with us. Okay. Didn't he share flesh and blood because the children had flesh and blood, Hebrews said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he'd be familiar with our weaknesses and able to sympathize with us. He is wrestling with us even now. How long does it take God to get a concept across to you? Right? Like, how about this one? You were wrong. Go ask for forgiveness. Oh, I'm sure all of you are so spiritual, you get that one immediately. Come on, husbands, wives. Uh-huh. How many times you, you slept in separate places, right? Waiting for God to tell the other one how wrong they were. I have no knowledge of such events. How about this one? Saul. Since the man saw Jacob, right? 
That's verse 25. When the man saw that he could not overpower him. This is to understand through experience. Saul doesn't just mean see with your eyes. It means that he was watching him, yes, but he was also interacting with him. Kind of like in English when we say, hey man, do you see it? Meaning, do you understand the whole picture? You probably don't have time to read it, but if you want to make a good note about it, how about Psalm 34? The Lord God is enthroned on high. He sees all mankind and He considers everything they do. This was a chance for God to have interaction with the man and to watch carefully how he reacted to everything in order to know exactly what was in his heart. This is when David says, Probe me, Lord, and find out if there's any iniquity in me. We start off in this walk at Bethel. We talk to the Lord about what we'll do for Him. But as we progress in this walk, you begin to catch glimpses of His face more and more. And you begin to wrestle with what He's showing you. You're growing up. And He's watching. God wrestled. God saw. The next one was God touched. Now in one sense, it looks like this is God's victory. Right? Because He injured the man and now He was the victorious wrestler. Do you really think God had confidence problems? <laughs> Touching is when you become aware of your weakness. The angel who represents God here. I mean, I literally think it's God, but God cannot be seen, John 3.13 says. So He had an angel of the Lord represent Him throughout the Bible until Jesus was incarnate, John 1 says. The Word became flesh, and now He is the perfect representation of the Father. To talk to Him is to talk to the Father. The fullness of the deity is found in Jesus. And if you have problems with my theology, we'll talk about it later. But Hosea says that this is an angel. Why is it an angel? Because the Father cannot be contained, period. The closest we can get to that is looking at Jesus. But it is the same as wrestling with the Father. And He touched Him. This is when God makes you intimately aware of your inability to overcome. Now He's praising Him for overcoming. And He's also at the same time showing Him you can't overcome. Isn't that a little bit like saying you can't overcome without me? Every day of Jacob's life he would limp. It was a reminder of his weakness. And what does Paul say about our weakness? It's an opportunity for God's strength. This is why when pride enters a man, the power of God leaves him. It's why humility is exaltation. It's why when you want to get to the head of the table, the place to start is the foot of the table. This is when we recognize where our limitations are so God can take us further. We don't dwell in our limitations. You don't stop walking because your hip hurts. You walk with a limp. Say, God, if you'll help me, I'll walk anywhere you send me. God didn't just wrestle and see and touch. He talked with him. They had discussions about what is your name? What is the defining characteristics of your life? Is the direction good? God looked at it and said, I don't like your name. I'm going to give you a new one. Doesn't the book of Revelation say exactly the same thing happens to us? Doesn't 2 Corinthians 5 teach us that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All of those scriptures. This happens as we look into the face of God. It's more than an altar experience. It's a lifetime of experiences that culminate and could be defined, could be given one day as a metaphor, as a wrestling match with God. Did He just stop at talking? No, He changed. He changed the man. He changed him from supplanter, deceiver, trickster, contender, to prince with God. When you recognize that you're alone except for God, when you recognize that as much as you're wrestling, no matter what the trials are, the purpose is to know Him better and have Him know you better. Amen. When you recognize that He is watching your every need to better know you and have you better know Him. When, when He touches you, He doesn't show up and say, how great thou art, but instead is showing you where you end so that you can see where He begins. Amen. It results in changing you. This is what salvation looks like. Bethel may be the starting line. 
Oh, if you'll be my God, then I'll do thus and so. Peniel is the finish line. It is the place where we have had experience enough to know that we're dependent upon Him. It's not a pledge, it's a lifestyle. It's not a promise. It's a daily direction. And in the end of it, it results in a blessing. He blessed him. Then he blessed him there, the NIV says. Where are you blessed? When you're alone, wrestling, being seen, being touched, being talked to, and being changed. This is where the blessing is. That's it. American Christianity has said, I, look, I'm an American Christian, so we're talking about me. American Christianity has made the blessing a 15 uh, second experience at an altar. It's made the blessing uh, a baptism or a church membership. Those are all Bethel and they're good. It's like recognizing I found the door, but the good stuff's in the back of the building. Okay. The buffet is at the back wall. And this happens when it has become our entire lifestyle. And as we look into the face of God, we have to wrestle with His character versus ours. As we look into the face of God, it is a little bit like realizing every area that you're limping and couldn't make it without Him. It's a little bit like realizing that given your own opportunity, you have one name, function, authority, and reputation, but God desires for you another. Are you hearing me, ladies, that struggle with self-image? Men who struggle with self-image? You may have been given one name, but as the young lady preached the other night, do you see what I see? God calls him a different name. It results in the changing of a human being, which ultimately is the blessing of a human being. If your life is not changing, you may have done a little more than set up some rocks at Bethel. That was good, but it was the starting line. The changed life is the proof that somebody is contacting God face to face. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you to do whatever it takes to get alone with God. Maybe Aaron and her uh, accompany Moses up the mountain along with Joshua, but there is a place when it is just you and God. Yeah. God said, y'all stay there, Moses, you come higher. What is the Lord telling you? In my life, there have been many of these experiences, not just one. Many times where it required me to go, Everybody's camped here and that's a good thing and I really like that they like me and I like them and there's some affirmation involved in that but the Lord is saying you must go a little further. And whether they go or not, like the old Baptist song says, I still will follow. I'm asking you to get face to face with God and see what happens. You may end up with a new walk, a new identity, a new function, a new blessing. Don't settle for Bethel. That was just the starting line. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to go to a men's meeting today. If you're a man. Maybe we meet all of the time. Uh, Monday night, we are in the book of Colossians. We've been working our way through the New Testament one line at a time, and we'll be back in the Older Testament. Uh, Wednesday, Brandon Fowler is uh, speaking. A very good message. Uh, I don't know what else is happening other than that. I tell you, it'll be good, though. Amen. You're welcome to join this community. If we see you three times, you're a member. Amen, Bill? That's it. Bill didn't want to wait three Sundays. He came one Sunday, one Wednesday, and then showed up at my house. Said, Third time you've seen me. Right? Um, our goal is not to build the biggest church in Houston. It is to see the face of God and see what happens. That will probably always be a remnant. I'm not mad at any churches. Not upset with any pastors. I just have my own field to work in, and I want good fruit, not something that's plastic. Okay. Y'all stand up, let's pray. Something that's been Botoxed. <laughs> We've been talking about India so much that we have uh, probably not mentioned enough to you. Uh, we go to Mexico almost every month. Um, I'm praying about one between now and India. Uh, if that doesn't occur, then there will be one as soon as we come back. Okay? We have friends there. They're on the wall back there. They, um, they love us and we love them and we're encouraged in each other's presence. I believe that your faith ought to have feet. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you to pray and see if you can accompany us on a trip. This is not for some select few. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. 
Mm. You say, oh, but I'm older, but I'm a woman, but I'm whatever. There will always be some... <laughs> I'm telling you, that's just Jacob's limp. You don't begin to know what you can do yet. The most powerful people I've seen in the kingdom had broken bodies. Okay. Uh, I figure if Nancy Davis, who had been a Methodist missionary for 40 years, can give her life for Jesus, yeah. what makes us so special that we can't risk ours? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, please be in prayer about those things. In December, I hope to have to take a bus. Okay. <coughs> Too long we bought ourselves Christmas gifts and entertained ourselves with things that our kids will never use. Uh, let's go buy rice flour beans and let's bring it to children who will scrape it off the ground that's so precious to them. Yes. So, okay. uh, I'm inviting everyone to pray, to fast, to think about those things because uh, I, I, it's been great that we take five you know, once a month. I'd like to take 60 uh, in one month. Wouldn't that be great? Yes. yes. Amen. You ready to pray? Yes. Yes. JJ, pray for us. God, thank you for this day. God, thank you for... Uh, God, for not only the place, God, that you met us, but Lord, for the place that we're going, God, that we're, uh, God, we're taking you with us, God, you changed our hearts, God, as we offer them to you. God, we ask as we go from this place, God, that your hand will continue to be upon us, God, that your, your blessings will go with us, God, not for our own benefit, but for your glory, God. Yeah. And that's why we serve you, God, it's for your glory, God, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Y'all have a good time. Go love the Lord.